privileged and blessed morning. Praise the Lord. Here again, we are online. Okay. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Prepare our hearts as we come before the Lord, before His throne, just to worship Him. Our eyes only focus upon Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we give you all the glory, God Jesus. We praise your name, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord, to be praised. We give you all the morning. Oh, my Jesus. We glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let us unite our hands together. Let's pray for our country, Malaysia. Abba Father, we pray for our beloved Malaysia. Oh, we know, Father God, that you are in control, Father God. And we believe, Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit is moving in this land. You're doing something greater, Father God, in this land, Lord Jesus. Oh, we believe, Holy Spirit. Oh, we come. And use all your people, Father God, in Malaysia, Father God, Lord Jesus. Oh, Father God, I believe, Father God, your gospel will be spread, Father God, to this land, Father God, Lord Jesus. Whichever door will be shut, Father God, will be open, Father God, Lord Jesus. Oh, to minister, Father God, to minister your words, Father God, Lord Jesus, that everyone, Father, will come to know you as personal Savior, Father God. Oh, thank you, Father God, Lord Jesus. We pray, Father God, in all situations, Father God, that happens around the country, Father God, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, that you, Father God, Lord Jesus, you pour out, Father God, the wisdom upon our, Father God, leaders, Father God, in this nation, Father God. Thank you, our Father. We give a glory. Anyone speak blessing toward your nation, Israel, Father God, Lord Jesus. For all your people, Father God, Lord, wherever they are, Father God, Lord Jesus. Oh, we speak blessing, your protection upon your nation, Lord Jesus. Oh, your people will come to know you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, gather, Father God, Lord Jesus. Father God, we believe, Holy Spirit, you are moving in this land, Father God. Thank you for your covering, Father God. We give a glory and honor, Father God, Lord Jesus. They will know you as personal Savior too, Lord Jesus. We have a step, Father God, into this land, Father God. They will come to know you, Father God, as personal Savior, Father God. Thank you, our Father. And this morning, we are ready to worship you, Father God, Lord Jesus. To give all, Father God, all, Lord Jesus, to you, Father God, Lord Jesus. Oh, our eyes focus on you alone, Father God, Lord Jesus. We are going to sing, Father God. We are going to run for you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We give glory and honor. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Are we ready to worship the Lord? Amen. I am free. Amen. We are free. Hallelujah. Let's sing this song, I'm free. Do you the blind will see? Do you the mill will see? Do you the dead will rise? Do you I have the praise? Do you the darkness? Do you the 
Good morning and welcome to Harvest Revival Center online service. If this is your first time with us, comment in the chat box below to let us know that you're watching with us. Now, let's have a look at this week's announcement. Physical prayer meeting at church will commence from the 12th March at 8 p.m. with strict SOPs taken. So come and join us as we continue to seek God through prayer. Sunday service will continue to be streamed online at 10 a.m. till further notice. So don't forget to tune in live on our Facebook and YouTube channel. That is all the announcements I have for you. And now, let's take up today's tithes and offering. Church, let's read from the book of Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much of blessings that there may be no room enough to store it. Church, giving is not just about sacrifice. It is God's way of ritually introducing us into the flow of sowing and reaping that is the subcurrent of His creation. Participate in the harvest that God has for us by sowing your gift with Him today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Father, for the good things that you have done, Lord Father God, during these difficult times, Lord Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, right now I want to pray, Lord Father, that you will bless these tithes and offering, Lord Father God, for your extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, have a look on the screen on how you can give online. Church, I want to encourage you. If you are stirred in your heart to bless our community during this pandemic, you are welcome to donate into our Agape Fund, which will be used to buy groceries and other necessities to bless those in need financially. So if you would like to donate, here is all the details you need to give online. Please remember to specify under reference for Agape Fund. That is all from me today, Church. And now, let's welcome our guest speaker, Pastor John Kirby, as he brings the word this morning. Have a blessed Sunday, Church. A blessed Sunday morning to all of you at HRC. Uh, I am Pastor John Kirby. Privileged to speak to you this morning here on this video clip. 
thank you, Dr. Bernard, for having uh, invited me to make this video. And of course, it's all a new experience for many of us. But we thank God that we we'll still be able to connect like this virtually, uh, even on this video format. So I'm uh, privileged to share the Word of God with you this morning. Let's just look to the Lord as we begin. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for every opportunity that we have to connect with one another, Lord, even on this platform, which is virtual. We thank you and praise you that your Holy Spirit is everywhere and your word, O oh God, is powerful. Even this morning to uh, speak to us and minister to us. And so, Lord, we just want to entrust our lives to you and ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to us afresh this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, I would like to speak to you about God's restoration. How God never forgets us, He never forsakes us. But even in our most desperate times of need, when we are on the verge of giving up, God comes not to condemn us, not to even reject us, but to encourage us and restore us. I'm looking at the life of Elijah this morning. And so we are looking into 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 13 in particular. And uh, it reads that it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave on the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice that said unto him, What doest thou hear, Elijah? Just what happened to Elijah, this mighty prophet, that God had called up to do great exploits for him. We are familiar with many of his miraculous experiences and his uh, works. Uh, and now at this point, Elijah seems to be uh, trapped in his fear. Uh, and he's probably wild head by now, a crushed soul. Uh, his hope seems to be dashed or lost. He even seems to be depressed a prophet in this very condition. What is actually going on in this situation? Uh, Elijah will eventually hear an earthquake, a fire and a wind. But I want you to know that these are wonderful things that God is using to reveal his plan for Elijah. What precisely had happened to this great prophet who had shut up the skies and stopped the rain for over three years we called a nation to choose which God they would choose to serve. Who had called down fire from heaven. We remember these accounts. Now he is found hiding in a cave. In a deserted, desert area. In a cave away from people, away from everything that seemed to be victorious in his lifetime. He is now seemingly in defeat and in shame. This was Elijah, the mighty prophet. A threat from a wife of a disobedient king, yet the hero raised to a place of honor. Now in Micah chapter 4 verses 5 to 6, if you look at that reference this morning, it reads, For all people will walk everyone in the name of the Lord his God, and will walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and, uh, and her that I have afflicted. We can lose sight of the vision and calling that God has given us very easily by the pressures of life and circumstances and situations and even the people around us can sometimes be instrumental to discourage us. But God never leaves us in despair. He comes to restore us. He has a plan for all of us. God cares. God comforts. God strengthens. God raises us up. Elijah would find himself from a place of hiding to a place of great rising. And God does all this without any sense of shame and guilt. He invites us to continue on in our journey of life, in our mission and the plan that he has for us. That plan with an expected end, as Jeremiah had recorded in 29 verse 11. 
In 1 Kings 18, 19 and verse 40, we read the account of how this great mighty prophet Elijah had stood up against 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. And what was the result? We see a miraculous breakthrough, not only for the people, but we see even the destruction of evil before their eyes when all these prophets were slain by Elijah. As a result of this, Jezebel, that wicked queen, decides to terminate Elijah's life. She threatens that she would kill him. And at this point, Elijah now flees to the regions of Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb, where God gave the Torah and made a covenant with his people, it is at the same place that God will now come to visit Elijah and speak to him. Consider how the church and how we might respond to Elijah, and how you know we might even know some Elijahs in our lives, and how we might respond to people who go through things like that. Would we abandon such people at their time of need? Or if a leader has fallen or failed in some point of his ministry, how would we as a church respond to such people? Uh, would we uh, abandon such people and start looking for a replacement and start looking up to somebody else or maybe even another prophet? Would we seek to show mercy instead? Hospitality. Sometimes they just need a friend to talk to. Sometimes they may just need to have a place to stay. Uh, are we going to offer encouragement to such people in a, a, a plan of restoration? Because God uses people even to restore other people. We see setbacks or despair or even sin as a sign that one is no longer worthy to serve God or that God has given up on that person. Now in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 4, we read how Elijah will pray for God to take his life. Now it must have been really very bad. It must have been really a very challenging and depressing time for Elijah. Because it reads, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He had now come to a point of giving up. He prays for God to take his life. Church, I want you to know there is no justification for suicide or even attempting suicide. I say this because so many people have come to a point in their life and believers for that matter, and many who have justified and tried to explain it off as there was some valid reason, as though there was something that was acceptable uh, for that individual to make such a crucial decision to terminate their life. And I want you to know God is the author of life. He is the one who is the beginning and the end. We cannot decide to be the end or cause the ending of our lives. God comes to give life and life abundantly. Sure, he takes that life away. He is God because he has a plan in all that. But I want you to know that we do not take the place of God in making decisions like that for ourselves. So it saddens my heart. It gets me really concerned most times when people have uh, experiences as such or have lost family members or even church members to suicide. And uh, I can think of it as nothing less than demonic because there's so many things that surrounds an individual prior to making this decision and terminating their own life. There's so many spiritual factors, so many spiritual uh, situations that surround this individual prior to that. Uh, and so we need to reach out to this person because God reaches out to us. And if the Bible offers us God's plan of restoration and life and forgiveness, you know, we need to pay attention to these things and not just excuse ourselves and say life is so hard, so challenging, and we are going to give up. Now in 1 Kings 19 verses 5 to 8, we see how God in such a loving manner sends an angel to come to minister 
to Elijah in his most challenging moments of his life and actually uh, gets him to rise up and eat. Obviously, he has not eaten over a few days and must be very weak. And of course, in verse 6, it says, he looked and he saw that there was already cooking something uh, for him on the fire. And uh, he ate and he drank and of course, laid down again. The angel came again the second time uh, to uh, feed him. I told him to arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Your journey has not ended. Your mission has not ended. God's plan for you has not ended. And he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days and 40 nights. If you read on in uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, going down to verses 11 to 13, you see how God speaks to uh, Elijah, not in anger, not in frustration, not in any sense of disappointment. But in the circumstances that came about, uh, you know, there was, of course, a great wind. If you read that verse, uh, uh, verses and a great earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, nor even in the fire, but uh, in that still, small voice. And in that voice, God actually asks Elijah, what doest thou here? Or what are you doing here? God comes to him. At this point, which he could give so many excuses and reasons and, and, and lament over all that's going on and complain to God. But God is concerned about what are you going to do about it? What are you doing here? What's the next step, Elijah? Elijah asks God to choose another man. But God is not done with him yet. How many times we feel that, you know, our time is up. Maybe somebody younger, somebody better should take over. But listen. God is not done with us. Maybe he's done with you in a certain place, in a, in a situation, but God's still going to use you somewhere else, if not that same place. So God comes to restore him. God is not done with him. God is not done with us. And he is definitely not done with me. And we get burnt out. We get stressed. We get fearful. We get short-sighted. We go into our own hiding many times, and that's the natural thing to do. But the supernatural thing is that God comes to us and restores us. Sometimes we feel our self-worth has gone out the window. We feel no more valuable to people when others are doing the ministry. You know, uh, we feel that others might be better. Or sometimes you look at other ministries and how they are seemingly more successful and then we begin to feel a little bit discouraged. If we remain there under the covers or like Elijah, under that mantle where he hid his face from the crowd, where he hid his face from people, where he hid his face in shame, it can turn into years of uselessness. God has actually great use for us. Vessels of honor, we are called in the Bible, not to go into a place of uselessness. And we are willing to be restored and remain faithful. God is never finished with us yet. Now Elijah, of course, has his prodigy, Elisha. And Elisha witnesses how uh, his time on earth comes to an end. A very, very a dramatic experience of how he is taken up uh, into heaven in a chariot of fire. And that's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. But uh, even then, uh, Elijah's ministry has not entirely ended. Elijah's service is still expected to be seen even before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ again. Uh, and uh, we'll come across verses like this. But we see that, you know, he appears again with Moses when Jesus is transfigured on the Mount Transfiguration. And then in Malachi 4, uh, God says that he will send the prophet Elijah uh, to us before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And uh, his ministry would be particularly turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and children to the fathers. Uh, in some versions it says uh, parents, but actually the head of the family is a father. So it specifically mentions fathers. And we know there's a great need for the restoration of fatherhood in families. And God wants to do that even before that great and terrible day of the Lord when Jesus returns to bring restoration to families, to bring restoration between 
fathers and their children, uh, parents and their children, and vice versa. The Jewish people to today have a great expectation and expression of the hope of Elijah's return. Now, when they celebrate the Passover, and in the uh, celebration of the Passover, there is the Haggadah, which is the telling or the storytelling, at the Seder, which is their dinner, uh, an empty seat is always kept at the table. And this empty seat is kept for Eliyahu or Elijah. And a cup is also kept at the table, interestingly filled with wine. And the children actually playfully come around and look for any sign of ripples as a wine uh, in that wine cup as a sign that Elijah has come to be seated at the table. So, awaiting for Elijah all year long at the closing of each Shabbat even. And the ceremony called the Havdala is a prayer that they sing. May Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah of Gilead, quickly in our day come to us heralding redemption. Now church, I'd like to look again at 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 11 to 13. I may look at uh, those three conditions that are described there from verses 11 to 13. First, there was the strong winds that blew and then the earthquake and the fire. But uh, it writes that God was not in these at all. Now, if you look at those conditions, you can imagine the tenacity and the ferocity and, you know, and, and uh, the seeming violence involved uh, in, in uh, these conditions there. And uh, the, the thing is that God was not in them. Sometimes, you know, we interpret whatever we're going through as God is uh, angry with us, God is annoyed over something, God is not approved over something. And, and, and at times we begin to allow self-condemnation to take over. And we find that all, uh, you know, that's what's recorded here seems to reveal the very nature of God in being angry with us. But the truth is in those verses, especially in verse 12, says that after all this came a still small voice. God came to Elijah with a still small voice. Yet I believe it was a great shout in his ear. What are you doing here? Now, I'm not sure about you, but I've had times, sometimes I felt like somebody next to me was saying something or shouting into my ear some instruction or sometimes saying, don't go there or go, you know. And uh, I, I knew it was the Lord because there was nobody else physically around me and I felt that strong impression, but it was so audible. And God comes to us and speaks to us like that sometimes uh, and most times through his word. But Elijah heard it through that still, small voice. He heard it with a mantle over his face, hiding in shame and defeat. But when he heard that still, small voice, God didn't come again to condemn him and say, what happened, you know, and, and how could you do this, and how could you fear, and how could you fail? But God asks him, what are you doing here, right at the entrance of this cave? What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your ministry? What are you doing here from this point on? And Elijah, we are told, comes out of the cave. Church, God is asking us to come out of our caves. Whatever it may be. The sense of defeat. The sense of disappointment. Everything that you might have gone through in 2020 or even in this year. God is asking you, what are you doing here? We need to come out. God is asking us to come out of our covers, out of our shadows, out of our past, and get back to what God had first planned for us. To get back into focus on what God still has for us in this journey of life. To allow God to rebuild our talents and skills, our spiritual gifts, to restore our strength, to, fi uh, to find our fulfillment and our new vision in what God has for us. Sometimes it requires us to actually learn a new skill and to develop a new talent. And that's fine. We're never too old to learn anything or to start anything new. Never give up. Now our passions may change. Uh, and even our ministry that we do might change. It might take a shift. But we remain faithful in our service to God. What he has called us to do, we will faithfully do. Speak, Lord, your servant.
servant is listening, even in this circumstance, even in this situation, even at this age, in whatever point of uh, in our lives, we need to have an open ear because God may be saying to us, what are you doing here after 20 years, after 25 years, after, you know, this failure and defeat? What are you doing here? Are you just hiding yourself or do you... Are you willing to step out of that cave and step into something new, into the dimension of the life that God has for you? We continue with our journey to win the loss, to disciple souls, to baptize people into the kingdom of God, to heal the sick and to cast out demons, to reach out to people, to reconcile the world back to God. That ministry has not ended. Even while you are still yet alive, even where you may be in any sense of defeat, God wants to restore you again. He needs you back in ministry. Second Corinthians 5.20 says that we are ambassadors for Christ. No matter how old we are, wherever God places us, we are ambassadors for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us immensely. You do not come to condemn Lord, your word says that you send Jesus not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Lord, you know we still need saving, even in our situations, our circumstances, the discouraging moments that we go through, Lord. You come to us and you come to redeem us, you come to restore us. And Lord, you do come to ask us, what are we doing here and Lord, we want to step out of our fears and our discouragements, of our failures, of our past and of our shadows into the marvelous light that you have called us, O oh God, to be in so that we can continue the good work that you have called us to do so that, God, we may remain strong and do great exploits for you. So bless us this morning, even as your word has blessed us, Lord. Take us on further, O oh God. Lord, teach us, Father, to trust in you with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding. We give praise and honor to you, Father, for you are a God who loves us, who restores us, who blesses us, who renews us, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being moved. God, we believe, yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. Because God, we believe, yes, we can see. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We step, step.
prophesy. Cause miracles happen when you move. Healing 